Greetings to you again, and it's sure good to be with you. And we're glad that we can spend a few more moments with you again today, that God has been gracious to help us, to encourage us, and to strengthen us. And we pray today that as we look at another discipleship empowerment word, that it may encourage you in your walk and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're talking about the word wind, and we've titled our message, Like a Mighty Wind. Actually, there was a book out that came out in the... I think it was the 70s or 80s that was titled Like a Mighty Wind about revivals and things that happened. I believe it was in Indonesia. But today we're going to talk about this idea of like a mighty wind, but we're just going to talk about the word wind and how it's used throughout the Bible again. All the way starting back through Genesis, all the way through, well, only this time to Ephesians. It doesn't go into the further along, but it does get talked about. And uh, it's very important today that we understand that as we look at this word wind, that a lot of the scriptures have to do with the physical side of what the wind does and doesn't do. Okay, so that's important that we understand that. But then as we get closer to the New Testament and in the New Testament, the wind takes on the idea, the concept, and also the name of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, one of the names for the Holy Spirit is the word wind. And so we need to connect that. So, but not all the time is there a connection through the Old Testament to the work of the Spirit. But a lot of times there is a connection when it comes to the word when, when it comes to God himself. And so we're going to be talking about this idea both in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. And some of them don't seem to have, it, as you say, any overlap, but others do. And so let's, uh, as we go through the scriptures today, just see which one is... Uh, speaking to us directly and which one is a a just a story or an illustration of what the wind may or may not do uh, on this world and so we're going to start off in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1 and that this is one of those physical times where it says then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him on the ark and God made a wind to pass over the earth and to water, for the water to subside. Now, again, here God made a wind, you know, where he caused the wind to move like as a breath over the earth. And one of the synonyms is the idea of breeze or a gust of air. But sometimes it's connected to this idea of, of a breath of God. And here again in with Noah, you know, we got the whole earth flooded, and now the waters are going to have to subside. And then God again creates a wind to cause the waters to subside. Then again, over in Exodus 15, verse 10, we have, the, of course, the idea of the wind again. And, and the people have just left Egypt, and now they're heading out and going across uh, the river, the Red Sea, I should say. And as they were crossing the Red Sea, as they got to the other side, now Pharaoh's army was in hot pursuit. And it gives us the idea in Exodus 15, again, through the Song of Moses. This is a, a, a song that, that is a praise song unto the Lord. And in this, he says, in verse uh, 10 of chapter 15, he says, You blew with your wind. The sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty waters so again we hear that god you know he blew and the waters divide and the winds divided the red sea but then the winds came back and the destructiveness of the winds and that's another thought that we need to be thinking about today when we think about wind wind can be very cooling very gentle nice to sail with but also wind can be very destructive as you know They've been having a lot of hurricanes and things like that down in the United States and tsunamis and things that, where the water comes up and, and waves of water come in. It can be very destructive. In fact, the wind can be so strong, it can push the current of the river in an opposite direction. It can blow it back up from the ocean up and cause the water to pile up so there would be great flooding. So wind can have both a gentle part to it but also a very violent and destructive part and here we see that how when the wind blew pharaoh's army was destroyed then we go over to numbers 
at chapter 11, verse 31. And here the wind is used again, but this time as part of God again doing something. And in, in, in 11, 31, you know, the people had just got finished complaining and are still complaining that there was no meat to eat. So then God creates a wind that blows and from the sea and it brings in thousands and thousands of quails. So they didn't have any meat. Then after this point, they had meat. And listen to what it says. Now a wind went out from the Lord. Now again, notice each of these three times so far, a wind went out from the Lord and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp about a day's journey on the side and about a day's journey on the other side and about a day's journey on the other side all around the camp and about two cubits above the surface of the ground. And I looked like this and I thought, you know, not only did, did God create and, you know, cause these quail to come, but the thing I like about it, he still made them to work for it. You know what I mean? They had to walk about a day's journey away to go get the quail, which is kind of neat. So he didn't just blow it into their tents and say, here's the quail, you know, just take them and clean them and eat them. But he said, here they are in the tent, or not, here they are about a, a mile or so, a day's journey away from where they were camping. So they had to go get them in every direction. So there was lots of quail. And not only that, they weren't walking around the ground, but they were about two meters up in the air. So they had to be jumping up and down to catch them. So that would be really kind of a funny humor sight to watch, that they would march out about a day's journey out, and then they would be jumping up and down all over the place to catch these quail. And then they would march back a day's journey so that they could eat of them and partake of them back in their camps and, you know, maybe preserve them of whatever they do. But here, the key thing is, is that the wind, the wind came and the quail came because of the Lord created a wind to blow. Okay, so there is, I, I just want us to see that, that God has the power over nature. And I think that's something we're going to see as we move into the New Testament, that God has power over the winds the rains, the water, all those things, even though God has created them, he still has power over them. Amen. And so again, but he wants us also to learn something about the wind. And this shows up in 1 Kings 19, 11 to 12. And it's a very interesting scripture. And you, and you would know about it. You've heard about it before. And he says to Elijah, he says, then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore into the mountain and there broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. So this great wind comes and blows the rocks around, breaks them up. It's very powerful into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And he says, and after the wind and an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. And he's doing all this in front of Elijah. But the Lord wasn't in, wasn't in the fire. And he finally says, and after the fire, a still small voice. And that's where the Lord was. Yes, the Lord does a variety of things to different, you know, using different elements of the earth, both fire, earthquake, winds, waves, all those kinds of things. But he wants to tell us too here, and I believe that's what he's trying to tell us with Elijah. In the midst of this, if we would quiet ourselves down and not be so frightened by what the storms would do. And this is what the Peter had problems with. He got looking at the winds and the waves and he forgot to continue to listen to the voice of God. The still small voice of God. And I think that's what God is trying to teach us throughout the Old Testament that he is the, has the control over all of these. And he is able to, to command them to do what his will is. But they're not his, necessarily his voice. They're doing his service. But what he wants the people to learn is that his still small voice is what we should be listening to. Then again, over in Psalm 103, verse 15 and 16, it talks about how this wind can become a scorching heat. He says, as for man, his days are like the grass and the flowers of the fields, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembered no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. So again, 
you know, it's like it's almost saying, don't get focused all on this material stuff, but get focused on God who is everlasting to everlasting. So you see that there's a little bit of spiritual connections just kind of weaving its way through where God is saying, you know, he sent it, he created it, but he still wants us to listen to who he is and to keep our eyes on him. And we're going to see that as we move into the New Testament. Again, in Psalm 135, verse 7, he says, he says, Oh, my soul waits for the Lord. 135, I should say, verse 7. Okay, he goes on to say, And he causes the vapors to ascend from the earth, at the ends of the earth, and he makes lightning on the rain, and he brings the wind out of his treasures. Out of his treasuries. And the, only, the funny thing about this, this idea of wind is a number of times connected to the word treasuries. Out of the abundance of God. See, that's the idea. God's treasuries are full and running over. And he has an abundance. And here within his treasury is the wind. And it blows out from within his treasury. You know, I don't know what we can say about that but it's interesting when we get into acts chapter one and when the holy spirit falls upon the people was that the wind that came out of his treasury the anointing of god's spirit upon an abundance of outpouring of his wind like cloven tongues of fire i don't know we cannot really say maybe when we get to heaven we're going to have to ask him about that but in psalm 147 verse 18 he talks a little bit more about this whole area of the wind. He says, He sends out his word and melts them and causes his wind to blow and the waters to flow. So again, he causes the wind to blow and his waters to flow. But listen to what this, uh, the wisdom book has to say, Proverbs in 30 verse 4. He says, who has ascended into the heavens or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Think about that. Who has bound the waters in his garments? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you know it. Wow. Think about that. He says he can hold the wind in his fist. And he can hold all the waters in his garment. And he says, what is his name? Then he goes on, not only what is his name, but he says here, and I didn't see this until I studied it before, but what is his son's name? Well, we know his son's name is the Messiah, Christ. We know the son's name is Jesus. And you put them together, Jesus Christ. We know that he is Lord. Jehovah, Lord Jesus Christ. That is his name. And that is the one who can hold the, wa the waters, I should say the winds, in his fist. Isn't that our Jesus? Isn't that why that he is the God of the treasury and he has it all? But not only has he had all, he holds the wind in his fist. And he says... His son, and what is his son's name? Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a marvelous scripture. Some of these I've never really paid attention to. See, again, as I tell you, a lot of these things we don't get because we, we pull them out one verse at a time and we don't realize there's a connection moving on through. Like we said over the last number of nights where we said Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament and then he's establishing the new covenant. And that's what he's doing. Isaiah 41, 16 talks about how the wind takes and blows away the chaff from the grain. He says, you shall whittle, whittle them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. You shall rejoice in the Lord. You know, when the enemies come and when the things begin to come against the people of Israel, God is saying, I'm going to bring about my wind and I'm going to scatter them like the chaff. There's going to be no substance to them. Jeremiah 5.13. He goes on and he talks about then these prophets. And here's an interesting way of describing these prophets. It's really unique. I've never seen this one before either. 
But he says, and my and the prophets become wind. But the problem is, when these prophets become wind, he says, what kind of wind? For the word is not in them. It's like they make a lot of noise, but there is no anointing or power. There is air coming out of these prophets, but there is no anointing behind it. And so he's saying here, these prophets become wind. They, they're blowing their trumpets, they're blowing out their words and everything, but there is no word in them. There is no word of God in them. Again, some amazing little thoughts. Jeremiah 10, 13. He says to him, and listen to this one again. Here it is again. And he says in verse 13, When he utters his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapor to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain, and he brings the wind out of his treasury. Here it is again. He brings the wind out of his treasury. Out of the abundance of God, out of the blessings of God, comes the wind. Well, we know who that is. Who is the wind? The Holy Spirit. We will see as we continue to move on. Ezekiel 37, 9. He says here, Also he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on this land, that they may live. O prophet of God, O son of man, here it is again. Do what? Breathe upon the people. Come like a wind from the four corners to do what? To bring life. Isn't that amazing? To bring life. Who brings life? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Hosea watch, says to us, Be careful how you sow into the wind. Isaiah 8, 7, he says, They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stock has no bud, and it shall not produce meal. It shall not produce. Aliens would be all swallowed up. Again, in Hosea thirteen fifteen, he says, Though he is fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness. Then his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. And he shall plunder the treasury every desirable prize. So he's saying here what's going to take place to the enemies of God. Again, God's going to use that wind. Amos 4, 13, he says, For behold, he who forms mountain and creates the wind, who declares um, um, to man what his thought is, and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. What is the Lord God of hosts? He is the one who creates the wind. And God is doing marvelous things through the presence of his wind. Again, it shows up also in a parable as we move into the New Testament. Jesus talks a little bit about it, uh, this whole idea of wind, and, it, and it's got to do with a foolish and wise builder. Because he says there's a time coming, those who build his house upon the rock, when the wind comes, it won't be blown over because it will be strong. Why? It will be firmly grounded on the rock. But he who is a foolish builder, when the winds and the waves come, that house will be destroyed, and everything that he has will be gone with it. He says here in verse 25, And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for they, it was founded on the rock. But then in verse 27, it says, The rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. See, God also is showing us here that he can use the wind as a time of testing upon who we are. If we're really, you know, firm in our Lord Jesus Christ, the wind cannot move us. But if we're planted on the sand and when the winds and the waves come, instead of showing that we have strength in our God and firmly rooted in Him, we get blown over. And we're going to see that Paul tells us that the wind is going to be like the winds of doctrines, all kinds of weird teachings and things. And you know, if you're not planted on the rock, when the winds of various doctrines come, 
they're going to blow us over and we will find out that we will be our house will be destroyed and we will lose all again matthew 8 26 he says you know there's the winds and the waves and and the disciples they're in a boat and is being tossed to and fro and uh, they were panicking and jesus was asleep he was at peace and finally they woke up jesus and in verse 26 it says but he said to them why are you so fearful o ye of little faith then he arose and rebuked the winds and the seas and there was a great calm but now the disciples marveled they said what kind of a guy is this that even the winds and the waves obey him you know what they needed to remember he is the son of god who holds the wind in his fist so when he comes out there and that boat is being tossed to and fro he's not worried about the wind because he holds the wind in his fist the disciples though they were fearful because they thought the boat was going down you know again so much scripture then in matthew 14 24 we have the again they're sailing in a boat going over to the other side but this time as they're sailing in the boat the boat the wind is going contrary to them you know when you're sending a boat you want the wind in your sails and going with you but here the wind was blowing contrary and so the harder they rode the harder it was and i think there's a story in there too for us you know when we're going against the wind of the holy spirit we won't be going anywhere because we're going contrary to what the spirit wants to do in our lives but it's interesting even though their boat wasn't moving and the wind was blowing against them and they couldn't go anywhere along comes jesus walking on the water and this time you know the disciples okay they're ready for this here comes jesus we now know he can what he can do and so uh, he comes over and he's walking on water so this time peter speaks out and says to jesus he said lord if that's really you can i come jesus said come sure you know no problem peter just keep your eyes on me and that's the problem of the world you know we look at the winds and the waves we look at the storms and the viruses and the sickness all around and as jesus said just look at me yeah, but Lord, look at the winds and the waves. And of course, as soon as he started looking at the winds and the waves, what happened? Peter started to sink and he cried out to the Lord, save me. And of course, God being a loving God, what did he do? He extended his hand and saved him. But again, you know, the one who is holds the wind in his hand, in the fist of his hand, and holds the water in his garment, he was the one that was walking on the water why because he created it he created it it didn't make him he made them oh what a wonderful thought then again over in mark chapter 4 verse 39 it's the same idea where jesus again you know that he rebukes he says then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea and peace be still and there was a great calm and there was a uh, the wind ceased and there was a great calm but he said to them, why are you so fearful? Why are you so afraid? Why are you in such a panic over all of this? And you know, I need that question asked to me all the time. There's things that we're doing and there are things that we're working on. And sometimes it's easy to get that unknownness of the fear of what may or may not happen. When we should realize that he holds it all in the fist of his hand. He holds it all in his apron. The waters he holds the wind he holds it in such a way that he uses it for his glory but he also has the power and the authority to rebuke it when it goes against what his will is because he created it aren't you amazed tonight isn't that beautiful then we move over in john chapter 3 verse 8 we got nicodemus Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he tells him an interesting thing. And this whole idea of, of being born again, he tells him, you know, you need to pay attention to this, Nicodemus, he says. He says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
So now that's where we get the connection to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit moves to and fro. The Holy Spirit is powerful to do all kinds of things in one's life if we would just trust Him. Sometimes we don't know if it's going to come from the right, from the left, straight down, straight up. We don't know, but that's how the Holy Spirit works. And then again, as we move over in Acts chapter 2, verse 2. Of course, we all, probably all know this one, and this is where we get our title from, Like a Mighty Wind. It says, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. A powerful wind of God. And I've experienced that. I've been in revival meetings and meetings in various parts of the world where from some strange reason a wind will come in through the windows or through the door and blow upon the people. And there is miracles, there is laughter, there is joy, there is excitement because the wind of God, the mighty wind of God is present. Oh God, God wants to blow upon us, but so often we are trying to hide in our shelters. We are trying to hide from the destructiveness, not realizing that God wants to blow like a mighty wind. You know, be like Elijah. Don't worry about the wind, God says. Don't worry about the earthquake, God says. Don't worry about the fire, God says. But Elijah, what you need to understand, you need to pay attention of, is my still small voice. That's where I am. Finally, over in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, Paul tells the Ephesians church, you got to watch out for various kinds of false teachers and stuff. Because in Ephesians 4, 14, he talks to them about this whole area of wind. He says, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness and deceitful uh, plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ Jesus. Don't be tossed to and fro by the winds of doctrines of this world. And there's lots of them. Lots of them. But we want to get in alignment to the wind of the Holy Spirit. The pure wind of God. So that when it blows into our seals, it blows us in a direction where we are going towards heaven. To the kingdom of God. Amen. And so let the wind of God blow. Not the winds of the world or the winds of false teachers or the winds of of the enemy watch out for those winds he says you should be mature enough now that you should know the difference between what is the winds of the lord and what is the winds of the enemy paul is saying to the ephesian church but those who understand the winds of the lord you will also stand understand that he is the head of the church and that he does all things through his precious love let's pray father we thank you lord god for the wind of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that the wind as the Holy Spirit is mighty and powerful and help us to get in tune and to be lined up to the movement of your wind, O oh God, your created wind. Let it blow us in such a way that it blows us into the greater depth of your kingdom and a greater depth of your word and it takes us all the way through to the place that we will be with you in paradise. And we thank you now for your wind, O oh Lord. And let it be mighty upon our lives this day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And let the wind of God blow in you and through you and anoint you like never before this day. Amen. God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you again tomorrow. Okay? Bye-bye now.